Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Tourism and Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul, where I send my Twitch livestream audience to their preferred destination, providing that they pay with the in-stream currency struts which they earn by watching. And here we have two of those tourists, Aprop and It's Nico, head for the moon. We are capturing around the moon with the Shuttle Mark II, and they are head for the Mir space station around the moon. Mir was supposed to be around Earth, but we put it around the moon. And I might have accidentally said that they were headed for Lunar Gateway in the previous episode, and that's because I'm always surprised when tourists want to go to Mir. But uh, here they are, and this Shuttle Mark II is configured with the pass-through system, in other words, the Kerbals are in command chairs and they get up and float out, so there's no point docking, as they'll have to EVA out to the station anyway, they can't use the normal transfer protocol in Kerbal Space Program. Now, one thing about the pass-through system is when the mouse hovers over parts in Kerbal Space Program by default, they glow green, and I needed to turn that off because otherwise whenever we're inside stuff and the Kerbals are floating around like this, they'll it will always be green. So that's not super helpful or and it doesn't look good. So I turned that off and in the future you'll see that, and someone in the past, you'll see that I have that turned off in order to make sure that the whole pass-through system is more pleasant. So here we are with the uncut journey of Aprop to the Mirror Station. Yes, very epic. Of course, uh, in real life, astronauts do not have these jetpacks to move about MMUs. They use the MMUs on the shuttle for a little bit, but then uh, deem them too dangerous and not necessary, a combination of the two. A little bit of a shame, but anyway, for a little while, for a brief shining moment, astronauts were able to jet around a bit. And here is its Nico head to the station as well. And so our two tourists will be deposited properly. In a way, Mirror looks a little bit more epic than Lunar Gateway. Though Lunar Gateway's configuration keeps changing, this mirror is more or less stable. There's usually a uh, uh, HTV supply vessel connected to it. And then there's a huge supply container that we've got on the docking port there, but otherwise it's fairly consistent. There I am looking at all the life support we need to deal with. Yes, that's basically the main thing in solar system tourism except for getting the tourists where they want to go, and that's dealing with the life support stuff. So and you can see the, the large list we need to pay attention to on that. So the Shell Mark II just transfers back to Earth and Earth atmosphere, and that's just a test to make sure it can do it and otherwise I'm not gonna follow it into the atmosphere because in the context of live stream that would be tedious since it's uncrewed and I didn't think it could save itself anyway. We would have to do a lot of error breaking passes and it'd be too complicated. So we will ignore the Shell Mark II as it is uncrewed and these are the Venus probes that we were going to use to test aero capture around Venus that were launched with the Shuttle Mark II and have been hanging out around Earth waiting for their transfer. So now they have their transfers to Venus and we make minor corrections to make sure they are properly hitting its atmosphere. And we will see whether these little capsules can aero capture properly and at what height. And here is NB Silence's mission to Venus arriving at Venus. So this was a nuclear propulsed, nuclear propulsed Nuclear Propulsion Vehicle, the NTR, Nuclear Thermal Propulsion, and we are using only part of its Delta V because the rest of the Delta V we're going to use to bring NB Silence back home. This is just uh, get into orbit and then wait and then transfer back. So the situation here. I mean, obviously NB Silence was not going to be landing on Venus. We do not try to kill our Kerbals. That just happens accidentally. So... Here I'm overburning a bit because I wanted to get into lower orbit which will make transferring out a little bit simpler later on. So that's the orbit we capture into. And of course aero capturing around Venus if it can be done safely would save us some propellant there. But we want to make sure that we can do it safely. I immediately plot the trip back home. And so yeah. Uh, we have enough delta V. The question is, what about boil off, right? Because it's liquid hydrogen going into the nuclear engine there, the Timberwind engine in that case. 
Okay, so here we have one of the capsules arriving. And we are going to see whether it survives. I bring it to a periapsis of 100 kilometers. So it'll have to make that adjustment with its own little RCS thrusters. But off it goes. It does have a parachute just in case it ends up having to land and we can test the parachute system out. But we really don't want it to. I didn't have anything else to put on top of there, so it's fine. It's amazing how sudden everything happens with Venus's atmosphere, though. You can see the flame effects getting very rapidly hot. And slowing us down tremendously. And it turns out that 100 kilometers is actually a good number for this particular mass on this heat shield. Now there are three variables. There's the speed you're entering the SOI at, or the speed that you're entering the atmosphere at, either way. And the mass of the thing, and then the area of the heat shield. And so the mass of the thing on the area of the heat shield uh, gets packed into the ballistic coefficient. And so if any of those variables are different, then the altitude that you need to enter the atmosphere at is going to be different. But for this mass and this heat shield arriving at this speed, uh, 100 kilometers got it into a very nice orbit, actually. And I got it into a full orbit there. We tried 97.5 kilometers with this particular probe, just a little bit lower to see if, or I think it may, might have been 98, some, something around there. It's just 2 to 2.5 kilometers different in terms of the height that we we're entering at but the result of that was that this did not capture it went it on a suborbital trajectory so it's going to land now yep now the whole landing business if you aren't capturing into orbit around venus then you get more g-forces when you're actually going down so you can see the g-forces build up here as we cross 90 kilometers and below. And the whole slowing down thing gets even more intense. I have no idea what the lunar rated heat shields are actually rated for because this seems like much more than coming back from the moon and yet the, the, the blader just doesn't go away. But anyway, I'm not complaining, it's fine. I, I want heat shields that can deal with a whole bunch of stuff. All right, so now it's all slowed down and Unfortunately, the parachutes did not work. Yeah, destroyed due to aero forces, whatever that means. We're only at 24 meters per second, for heaven's sakes. But then again, the atmosphere is like 92 times that of Earth. So, yeah, I guess we'll need some special parachutes. But yeah, when the margin is 2 kilometers, as far as the difference between capturing into a nice orbit and coming straight down, well, even at 23 meters per second, we mostly got wrecked, but the probe core survived there with the parachute remnant on the top. So success, maybe? Anyway, so there's a really tight margin when it comes to aero capturing around Venus. It was sheer luck that I got the first one right with 100 kilometers. I think I did a poll with my audience to see what they thought might be good. And there was a range of views, and I, I forget how I resolved that. Anyway, here we have uh, Energia in the format of a Vulcan rocket, in other words, a Vulcan with four boosters, uh, launching from Cape Canaveral, as I do, and uh, carrying some supplies, as usual. In this case, we are headed for Lunar Gateway, which is basically our primary supplies destination. It always seems to have too many people, and we always need to send more stuff to it. At some point, we're going to have to work on in situ resource utilization and everything, but uh, on the moon, that's easier at least. That would be good. Except, you, if you recall, our ISRU landers have a bad tendency of blowing up or popping off of the surface. So, yeah, the overheating issue is, is an issue. But, yeah, we really need to get more of that going. So, here's a transfer out to the moon. And then the extended HTV with three AJ-10-190 engines, because apparently I was not in the mood for waiting around here. Uh, capturing, well, this isn't the capture burn, this is the correction burn. And actually, we'll see the upper stage floating by there, the Vesuvius stage. All right. And now we get the capture burn. 
And that other correction was just to make sure that we could correct inclination with respect to our target. And I have so much fuel that I decided to quicken the rendezvous by doing a radio burn here. And here we are arriving at Lunar Gateway in its current configuration. But yeah, it, it often looks quite different. It's very flexible. Mir always seems to look like Mir. With Lunar Gateway, you'd be forgiven for not even being able to properly see the Halo module or the Propulsion module, which are the only two modules of this particular Lunar Gateway that are actually real. Okay, there we are, docked up, and that is what it looks like right now with a pair and a whole bunch of business. Two HTBs connected to it. Normally, Lunar Gateway is much further away from the moon. We actually docked with it at its periapsis, so we get a nice view of the moon with it for once. Normally, the moon is very, very small and very, very far away. Next up is the Saturn Amphibious Assault Ship, I think I called it. It has a lot of little landers for the moons of Saturn, especially one for Titan. And it's using the Attila Thruster, which is an augmented arc jet. Think of it as an ion engine that doesn't take quite as long. Uh, and we have our approach to Saturn. We are trying to make sure that we get a good approach to Titan, though, in particular. So I need to correct inclination and line up with the moons and everything. So the people who are potentially going to use those landers are Arthur and Katak here, and also Mr. Doobie and Dialog Root, who are also en route to Saturn. Arthur, of course, paid for a very luxurious ride to Saturn with the rotating hab and everything. So here we've got that there. And this is a supply vessel. This is a supply vessel for Uranus. And so we make a minor correction with its ion engines. Um, that is a lot of ion engines. Actually, there are 50 individual ion engines in that. Each of the blocks is 10. And though it's not very apparent because it's tucked in pretty tightly there, they're powered by a nuclear reactor, a very small nuclear reactor. But otherwise, it wouldn't be possible to send it all the way out to Uranus with solar panels, of course. Anyway, here we are with Almaz which is our third station around the moon. We visited all of them in this episode, and we have to supply it too. It's got its supply vessel there is wiggling its little engine there, but we needed to free up a docking port, and so I separated the bridge station that originally helped get the Almaz into orbit around the moon. Unfortunately, I forgot that this bridge stage didn't have a proper controller on it, an independent controller from the Almaz, so it was dependent on the Almaz for control, and now it's just a drift in orbit around the moon. I decided to try to launch the supplies to Almaz on a SLS with the shuttle mice carrying the RS-25s, but no upper stage, so this is not a Block 1 or a Block 1B or anything like that, it's, it's a Block 0, if you will. Uh, so it's a core alone with boosters, it's a, not really a core alone then. But no upper stage, here go the boosters. The boosters are just normal ones. And the idea was, and I think I made a video about this uh, at about the time that I did this stream, is how much capacity does SLS have if it doesn't have a upper stage. The trick here is to put another engine on the bottom of the SLS core so that when the shuttle mice separate and go back into Earth's atmosphere, that one engine can then boost the payload out to the moon, you see. That's a sure strut engine that's basically the equivalent of BE-3U, and it didn't have enough delta V. It was about 400 kilonewtons, 460 second ISP engine, hydrolox, and so... But it didn't have enough delta V, so I decided to try something different. And that different thing was putting a Timberwind nuclear engine at the bottom of SLS. Now, in order to do this, of course, we only need hydrogen for the Timberwind nuclear engine. So I underfueled the oxygen in the oxygen tank. So we aren't carrying as much oxygen as SLS normally would. And as a result, it still is enough to get uh, the payload to orbit and everything since, well, we're overall carrying less. And now with the shell mice separating off, and of course they will return with their precious RS-25s back into the atmosphere, uh, we have our Timowin fire up, and it does have enough delta-v to transfer the payload over to the moon. 
and so now SLS is usable. But of course, it requires an NTR, a nuclear thermal rocket, and we don't have an operational one of those, but <laughs> it does simplify things, doesn't it? And if you consider that the boosters are recoverable and the shuttle mice are recoverable, uh, you just need a way to maybe reuse the stage with the Timberwind on it, and that would be interesting. I need to work on that. Uh, I had ideas for this, and I completely forgot that I had ideas for how to use the SLS core like that, but yeah, I need to develop that. Anyway, here we are trying to dock the supply vessel to Almaz, but as usual, that docking port doesn't work with that docking port. Uh, I don't know why. But so, I, I prepared for that, so I put the claw on the opposite side of the supply vessel and used the claw to dock it to Almaz so that Almaz would continue to have supplies even though we should probably deorbit Almaz and just destroy it altogether because we have two other stations around the moon anyway. Why do we even have this here? Anyway, so that's all supplied. And as the last thing, I wanted to send a crew vessel out to Skylab 2, which is just around the Earth, and we decided to use a dragon on a Falcon 9. So, fairly straightforward, and then we'll be able to bring some Skylab residents back home, especially since normally a lot of people go to Skylab and then accumulate struts by watching and then want to go somewhere else, right? So it's a very common destination where people are just going to be going there for a short amount of time and then moving on to some other location as they watch more and get more struts to afford more significant missions. So anyway, we send the dragon out there. Now one downside to the dragon is that it uses RCS thrusters for all its orbital maneuvers and its RCS thrusters, the Draco little thrusters, are not really feisty. They take a long time to do anything. So I added supplementary RCS thrusters in order to quicken things up a little bit. So you'll see me that it's those RCS blocks there. They helped out doing the maneuvers, but now we're approaching the Skylab, so I'm shutting them off because we don't need all that force anymore. And it would probably throw off my ability to dock properly anyway, because you'll have one one direction where the thrusters are really, really forceful, and then all other directions they are not. So here we are trying to line up uh, for a docking. However, uh, it didn't really fit properly. I think it was some combination of the nose cone colliders and also the fact that the colliders on some of the other modules aren't exactly perfectly with the mesh, if you will. So even though there's visually enough clearance, there isn't actually enough clearance. Uh, I know I'm a little bit off there, but that, that wasn't really the problem. So I decided to move the supplies out from the HTV into the other containers, especially Skylab itself, move the HTV off and deorbit it. So off it goes, and then Dragon will be able to use that particular docking port. So, yep, lining up. As far as whether anybody is going to be coming back down on it, that'll have to wait for the next video. Here we are just docking it. And we will leave it here at Skylab 2 for the time being. We have a few residents there who might want to make use of that dragon, but we'll see in the next video. So with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.